Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this wet and windy Saturday. I uh, hope you're all keeping well and not too Zoom fatigued just yet. Uh, it's a, a real pleasure to be joined today by David Banks, who is uh, a media law expert. I, I, I have sort of thought of him as a bit of a celebrity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he'll laugh, but honestly, in, the, in student media circles, he certainly is. Um, he runs his own consultancy uh, firm and we're really, really lucky to have him today. So um, please do sort of make full use of, of his brain. We're going to try and do this as sort of Q&A focused as possible because there's, it's obviously such a big, broad topic, media law. It's best if we can kind of delve into questions and issues that are most relevant and important to you. That can be issues or experiences that you've had. Um, but obviously try not to kind of say anything that might libel anybody else or, uh, you know, try and keep sort of details uh, a little bit vague if you, if you need to. Don't be afraid to do that and, and make sure that if it's a, an experience that you're showing of somebody else's that you've heard about that you also don't, don't name them if they don't want to be named. Um, we're going to be going through uh, for the next 45, 50 minutes and we'll be ending at 4.50. Uh, obviously, it's great if you can have your cameras on, it's much more comfortable, and if you'd like to ask a question, uh, then you can raise your hand, and then we can unmute you, and you can ask it that way, or alternatively, if, uh, if you're in bed, or don't fancy uh, putting your camera on, then you can always use the chat box. I'll encourage you to use those, uh, to sort of start piling the questions in as early as possible, so we can see how many we've got. Uh, some of you did fill out the form in advance, so I've got a couple of questions to kick us off with, but first, David was very kind of kindly going to give us the sort of most broad brush version of the common sort of student media pitfalls when it comes to media law and I'm sure just take 30 seconds to talk a little bit about his himself and his experience so over to you David. Great thanks Aubrey. Well hello everyone um yeah I just thought some of you despite my celebrity status some of you, <laughs> some of you might not know me so I'll just quickly explain who I am um yeah I'm a, I'm a journalist not a lawyer Okay, which I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. But anyway, I've been a journalist now for 30, 30, God help me, 33 years. Um, and I, but way, way back in the midst of time, I did a law degree. Uh, decided I didn't want to become a lawyer, decided I wanted to be a journalist. And so I went off in, and into a career in journalism. But then um, some years into that, as I was kind of climbing the greasy pole of management, um, <clears throat> one of the editors I was, I was working for suggested I go and work at the company training center for a while. He said, go off and do, do six months of condiments at this training center to add that into your sort of management skills, add training in, you know? So I thought, all right, I'll go up there. And it was in Newcastle as well, which was quite an attractive proposition because Newcastle obviously has this reputation as being something of a city that knows how to enjoy itself. So off I went to Newcastle for what was supposedly six months. Um, and they found out I'd done a law degree there and they said, well, you can teach law to journalists then, can't you? And that's how I kind of stumbled into the rest of my career. What was meant to be a six months of common became everything I've done since kind of thing um, is, is teaching law to journalists. And so for a long time, I've worked with mainstream media, broadcasters, online print publishers. Uh, and then about probably about 10 or 11 years ago, I was contacted, first of all, by York uh, University Students Union. They were the first ones to contact me and said, can you come along and do a session for our student journalists? Because we're a bit concerned about, you know, the legal risks that they might be incurring. Uh, and so that's how I kind of started that. And um, the number of kind of unions and, and um, student media I've, I've been working with has grown ever since. I probably, I think, I haven't actually counted them up, but I probably work with about 30, 35 different unions and student media around the country. And I've been doing that for a long time. So I do two things, basically. So this is a little bit of the ad break, OK? Uh, I do two things. I do uh, media law sessions, a bit like today, but longer, where I talk about media law and how to avoid all the pitfalls that happen. And then the other thing I do is um, consultancy, where if a student media uh, publication broadcaster is worried about something, they can contact me and show me the copy, and I'll say, right, don't write that, write this, don't say that, say this, and so I can vet their stuff for them to avoid legal risks those are two things that i do so if you're interested get your union to get in touch with me and we can talk about how i can help so what i'm going to do now i'll talk i'll talk now about some of the main pitfalls that crop up with all the different student media i've i've kind of encountered the, mo the most common things that 
that go wrong and, and have caused issues maybe over the last sort of couple of years or so. I won't be naming names or anything like that, not revealing any sort of um, um, secrets, but just broadly the kind of issues that you need to look out for if you are publishing, broadcasting, um, online, uh, using social media as, as, as student media. Um, and probably the, the first thing then, the, the main issue you need to worry about all the time, if you if you're in student media and if you're going into career in journalism, this is the legal issue that will dog you throughout your professional career now and forevermore, unless some massive change is made to the law. And that's libel. OK, libel laws in this country have always historically been some of the most savage in the world. We have had a bit of reform over the last few years to try to redress the balance and make it a little bit safer for publishers. But we still have what is one of the most favourable environments for claimants in the world. So if you're publishing, if you're broadcasting in the UK, libel is a constant threat. And libel, you know, just a few basics, it's the law that protects reputation. Claimant comes after you, they say you've published something, you've broadcast something which has damaged their reputation, then after you for damages, for cash compensation for the damage to their reputation, okay? And that can be up to £300,000. So it's really expensive but on top of the, the cost in damages you've also got the legal costs to consider as well legal costs can easily get into the hundreds of thousands of pounds as well so it's inordinately expensive so unions who fund student media who, who are ultimately responsible for what you do and legally responsible for, for for a lot of you um they worry about this because it's potentially you know a, a, a massive drain on their uh, resources so what a claimant has to show to bring an action against you is that if you've said something that, that lowers their reputation in the eyes of other people, if they're a company, they have to show that you've financially damaged them or, or likely to. But individuals, they have to show serious harm to their reputation. OK, now it would be great if I could give you a list now of these are the things that that is. Right. Don't say any of these things about the people that you write about. But the problem is that that changes all the time, you know. We change as a society and what is um, damaging to someone's reputation changes as we change as a society. So, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, the morality of the sort of 50s, 60s, which, which was a bit more straight laced, a bit more um, you know, severe, doesn't apply now. And you can say things about people that are not damaging the reputation, for example. If you said 50 years ago that someone was gay, that was definitely a defamatory thing to say about them. It damaged their reputation. The reason being was that, well, probably about, no, about sort of maybe 60, 70 years ago now, um, it was illegal. You know, so you're accusing someone of a crime. So it's definitely defamatory. Now, we have obviously and quite rightly moved on as society. And so saying that someone's gay now is not defamatory. It's not something that the courts will say right thinking people would regard as damaging to reputation. So saying someone's gay isn't defamatory and quite right too. So things move, things change. Okay. And so if you think about some of the debates that are going on in recent years and the, the, some of the kind of issues which you might be covering as student media, you think about terms that have, 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 uh, are being bandied about, being used about people that might be damaging to reputation. So, for instance, things like uh, accusations of anti-Semitism, definitely defamatory if you, for, you, for you to say someone's uh, an anti-Semite. Um, is, likewise, Islamophobia is, is def defamatory. And um, transphobia as well um, is definitely defamatory. Um, so these, these things um, are... Um, potentially defamatory. So you, you, this isn't to kind of in, in curb, curb your freedom of speech. You know, you are going to address these issues, but you have to think about how you, how you say these things and in, in your, the articles that you publish. So, for instance, you could, it would be reasonable and it would be an honest opinion to say, I think that is a transphobic thing to say. Okay. That is quite different to saying, I think that person who said it is a transphobe. One thing is an opinion about one thing they said. The other, calling someone transphobe, is a statement about their entire state of being. 
okay so what we look for is nuance in the things that we write in the things that we broadcast and things like that so you need to be careful about defamatory meaning and about the sorts of robust campus debate that goes on that can lead to um, these things being said one thing you have to be cautious about is the repetition rule in libel okay you might well think well as a student media outlet you know we're not saying these things we are uh, reporting what some of the student body have said we are interviewing you know academics or the people who are saying these things to us the rule in libel though is that anyone who repeats defamatory content is liable for it so the person you interview has a liability because they say these things you then have a liability because you repeat them to your audience okay so they can be sued the person you're interviewing can be sued but you can be sued as well so we don't get off we don't get away with saying we're not saying this we're just telling you what someone else said okay nor do we have a defense of saying we honestly believed something was true when we published it um, truth is a defense in libel but to have that defense you have to be able not to say we thought it was true or we honestly believed it was true you have to be able to actually prove it's true so you need to think about how you're going to do that what evidence do you have do you have you know documents photographs audio video these kind of things be very careful and i cast no aspersions against individuals here be really careful about individual students as a proof of truth okay you may very well believe they're telling you the truth okay and they may well give you a very compelling story of what's happened what they've experienced what they've seen what they witnessed whatever but you have to be confident that they will confirm that potentially in a court of law and people you know and this is just generally not just students people generally have got an awful habit of telling journalists one thing but then when a legal threat emerges they vanish to the four winds and you're left carrying the can so you need to be you know cautious about that and if you have um, someone telling you something get corroboration can they produce some evidence some you know even other students that corroborate what they say so libel's an issue the other issue that's emerged recently is in privacy okay we've all got a right to privacy and privacy is being kind of developed by the courts it's a relatively recent development in in um in the law in this country we haven't had privacy rights for a long time only really since the human rights act in 1999 so the courts are developing the law and kind of a set you know trying to define it and work out what it is and what it covers and, and things like this. What they've lately crept into is um, criminal investigations and started off with Cliff Richard and the BBC. BBC flew a helicopter over Cliff Richard's house when it was being searched by the police. Cliff Richard sued the BBC and the court there said someone who is being investigated by the police has got a right to privacy. Now that's never been the case in the past so we need to be careful about people being investigated by the police. And then there was another case involving Mail Online. Mail Online named a man who'd been arrested after the Manchester Arena bombing. Um, he, he was a, a Libyan pilot and they, they named him in the coverage. Now, he was one of lots of people that got scooped up by the police in the wake of a terrorist incident like this. They arrest absolutely everyone connected, in any way connected. And this man's name had appeared on a mobile phone that was owned by um, one of the bomb bomb plotters so he, he gets arrested held for about five days released without charge you know nothing against him there was no evidence he was totally unconnected just unfortunate enough that his name was on this guy's phone um and he'd been arrested and now the the mail online had named him and he sued the mail online for breach of privacy and the court said someone arrested by the police has got a right to privacy so that's really, really dramatic change. It means we can't name people arrested. You know, put it in a campus context, student gets arrested on campus, you might want to report this, or a member of academic staff gets arrested. That's really interesting. And you want to want to report it. Now you have to be really careful about that because they've got rights to privacy. 
at that initial stage, the stage of arrest. OK, so you would need to show that it was overwhelmingly in the public interest to identify them in these circumstances. So it's not just a case of it's happened, they've been arrested, we're going to name them anymore. You've got to think about privacy. So you'd look at the circumstances. If it was an arrest, a very public arrest, the police stage a raid on campus, let's say there's some sort of drug dealing going on, and it's a big raid, loads of police knocking down a door, arresting, arresting a student. Now, you can argue then this is not a, this is not a private matter. The, 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 the campus community have seen this gone on. We need to report that. And the, and the courts would probably agree. If it was something quite different where police had arrived in plain clothes, they'd made an arrest, no one really had seen it, then there the... Um, the arrested person has got a much greater claim to say this is a private matter. I've got a reasonable expectation of privacy there. So you need to be careful about arrests. Um, yeah, the other thing I want to talk about is copyright. OK, this is a real issue for lots of unions. And the problem behind it is Google image search. OK, you're all trying to populate your websites with illustration pictures to illustrate all the things, the myriad things that you cover. And I think part of it's to do with the kind of the education system. I've got, I've got three kids who are in the education system and they're forever producing posters and projects and things like this. And right through school, they're told, just find, find some pictures on the internet, you know, and they, and they find the pictures on the internet and they put them into their project. And again, in lots of your academic work, your lecturers might be telling you that if you need an image for this, you can get something on the internet. And that's fine because there's, an, there's a defense for if you're using imagery for, for educational purposes, it's, you can do that. It's not a breach of copyright. because It's staying within your educational institution. It's not going outside, it's not being produced for profit. But then you get involved in student media and you do the same in student media on student media websites. Um, and what happens then is you get done for breach of copyright. Lots and lots of organisations now, especially those with large image archives, are using um, claims agencies to look for their work. And what these claims agencies do is they use um, bots to crawl the net looking for the imagery owned by these archives. So they've got like a copy of the archive in their memory and then their bots just go out there 24 seven looking for these images. And I've now dealt with so many unions where they've had a massive bill um, from one of these agencies that has found use of copyright imagery on a website that student, student media. One of the latest ones we had, again, I said naming no names, but it was a student radio station, and they'd used about 12 images um, from Reuters. Reuters is a big news agency. They used 12 Reuters images about three or four years ago. And anyway, this claims firm found them and sent them a bill for three and a half thousand pounds. Now, actually, three and a half thousand pounds for about a dozen images is, is not actually, it's about the going rate for, for images, but it's a massive amount of money to come out of the budgets for this uh, radio station. Anyway, we negotiated it down. In the end, Reuters settled for less than a thousand pounds. Still, still a big sum of money, but a hell of a lot less than what they were originally claiming. So if anyone, any of your student staff are putting imagery into your website, onto your social media, anything like that, you've got to tell them. They need to either have permissions to do so from the copyright holder, and that is the creator of the, whoever took the photograph, or they've got to be using Creative Commons sites. And if they use Creative Commons sites, they must make sure they're complying with the T's and C's of that site. Very often, the terms and conditions of the sites will ask for a link back to the original site you got it from and a byline for the photographer. And we've had, again, I've had unions where they've had a bill because they didn't byline the photographer. So this, this is the thing that will cost you money if you're doing this and it might not cost you money this year and this is part of the problem a lot of the crop problems these that these cropping up are things that students did three or four years ago and they've gone you know they're they're, they're off on their careers they've finished but the imagery is sitting there waiting for someone to find them so it's a real real problem and the final thing i want to talk about then is um 
identification in sexual offences. Your campus is like the rest of society, sexual offences happen. Um, but campus is different, is, is because you're a small, closed community. And you're about the size of a small town. Most campuses are about the size of a small town. But you're not like a town in that you've got a massive age range of people, lots of kind of different sort of social demographic and, and economic demographics and things like that. You're kind of compressed. You're all roughly the same age, you know, that's sort of narrow age group. Um, and you're all there in, in campus together and you know a lot about each other. And what that means for student media is that it's sometimes if they publish what might otherwise be innocuous detail about a victim of a sexual offence, when you put that in the context of campus where we all know so much about each other, about each other's movements, about the lectures we attend, about the places we are at certain times, it can be an identifying detail about the victim of the offence. And that's the pe that, these are the people you need to be you know, awfully careful about when reporting sexual offences. You must do nothing which might allow someone else on campus to work out who they are, okay? And someone else on the campus could be the, 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 the rest of the students on their course, the rest of the students in their hall, all of whom might, you know, from some detail you publish, might be able to go, ah, right, I can work out who this is now. So you need to be very, very cautious if you're doing any coverage of that sort of thing to examine carefully the detail you're publishing so that you're eliminating anything that might be identifying about a victim. So those are the things that I wanted to talk about to really kind of flag up to sort of say beware of um, and now I guess it's kind of over to you for kind of questions anything I can help you with anything you want to ask me. Excellent stuff. Uh, we'll put questions in the chat box I'll, I'll start by going through uh, the ones we had submitted in advance and I, I should just say um, there's been, you, you may even know about this or but there was a, another student publication that this week got stung by exactly what you were talking about with the, right. the issue of crediting images this week. Right. Um, I hadn't heard of that, but, but uh, yeah, it's, it's even, no, I, I probably one of the most constant problems I get contacted about, you know, um, if, if it happens, right, you know, and, and it's, it might be, it might be something that's prior to your responsibility, prior to your kind of involvement, with the student media, right. Throw yourself on their mercy. Okay. Write a polite letter, pointing out your student publication, pointing out you make no profits. Um, tell them, you know, and make a really, if they've named a figure, you can either make a really low offer or ask them politely if they'll waive their fee this time. We have had a result that way a few times where a publisher has agreed. They've said, all right, we'll, you know, we'll waive your fee. You know, so you can get away with it. But like I said, be polite, be responsive. And sometimes it'll sometimes it'll work. At the very least, they'll they reduce the charge, you know. And I wonder if the it was in this case the person said that uh, it got it was a photo from Wik Wikimedia, um, which they were allowed to use, but they didn't credit correctly. Yeah, uh, and so put Wikimedia rather than the photographer's name, and then it got picked up by a call of site. So I guess. If you're, if you're, will you be contacted by these kind of sites that do it on companies' behalf? Or you, yeah, I mean, most often it seems to be um, um, rights rights enforcement agencies. And what happens is these, because because big organisation like Reuters, um, it, it kind of saves them a lot of money. It's it's a it's a basically a deal. They 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 sort of assign their their claims enforcement to this um, company um, and, and the company, that company then gets a cut of whatever they manage to claim. And so Reuters get an income from it and the claims company, they get their you know, 10, 15, 20%, whatever it is that they're, they're claiming. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the way these, these organizations operate really. Oh, I can't hear you, Aubrey. <laughs> Thank you. There's already a couple of qu questions in the chat, just again to follow up on stuff we've already talked about. Um, first of all, is there a is there a specific size when you're talking about a group of people that you can't identify, whether that's kind of, you know, yeah. risk of defamation or risk of uh, accidentally jigsaw ID? What's okay. the sort of is this? Is this with regard to? Um, 
I guess this is regards to libel, is it? I think. Well, I, I thought about it because of what you mentioned. I think it was about yeah. sexual offences. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, or a more general principle. Of, well, I'll, I'll deal. I'll deal with both. Okay, with regards to sexual offences, it's the question is: Is there something in there which which would identify this individual person, which allows someone to put a name to to the victim? So, saying. A student at the at the university is the victim of sexual. You no, know, no one's going to be able to put a name because of that. But it's where you start narrowing down to to. You might say it's a particular hall of residence at a at a particular time. Um, it might be um, uh, a kind of um, a lecture they were attending or something like this. It might be some details like this which might allow people to put piece together. Um, bits of information which allow them then to identify the um, the victim, and so it's being very very careful in the knowledge that um, if we did if mainstream media did it in the outside world, it wouldn't be an identifying detail but because you are in this um, kind of much more uh, enclosed community. Um, it, it, it's more of a clue. Okay. Just with regard to identity in, in libel, um, one of the things the claimant has to show is that they've been identified by what you've published. Now, a lot of the time what we publish, we name people, we name them and things like this, in, in which case it's not up for, up for um, discussion. Sometimes though, and I do see this with student media, um, a decision is taken to, to remove a name because they realise it's a defamatory story. And they think, okay, right, if we keep that person's name out, then the story will be safe. It, it doesn't. It, do, it doesn't really make you safe, though, because again, there might be enough detail, context within the story, for students, staff on campus to identify who it's about. Okay, so it's still there's still identity there, but the greater danger of doing this by taking out a name is is what's called a group libel, and this will be a classic one where you do complaints about lecturers or anything like that. Now, let's say a group of students come to you and they've got complaints about an architecture lecturer and, uh, you know, he hasn't been attending lectures, hasn't been marking work. A group of students really concerned. They think they're going to fail their course because of the behaviour of this lecturer. You want to do the story on it, but you realise it's defamatory implications. And so you take out his name. OK. And publish it. Well, it turns out then there are only five possible lecturers that could be. There's five lecturers teaching first year architecture on that campus. Instead of getting sued by the one who the complaint was about, you, you're potentially getting sued by all five of them because they can all say someone think someone reading this might think that's me. The other the other um, gr group I worry about in in campus terms in around this is coverage of sports societies. Now you know I speak as a former member of Liverpool Polytechnic Rugby Union Football Club, whose behaviour of a Wednesday evening after a match was not always as exemplary as you might wish before social media. So nothing ever got recorded, but um, sometimes you might, you might cover the misbehavior of a, of a squad. And in doing so, you, you are um, libeling the whole squad. And when in actual fact, it was probably a small number of them. And those who weren't involved can say, well, hang on. When all this was going on, I was tucked up in my bed drinking my cocoa. You know, it had nothing to do with me. But someone reading this might think that's me. So you need to worry about small identifiable groups. Now, unhelpfully, the courts have not put a number on that. So you couldn't libel all the lecturers at university. But if you narrow it down to a particular subject and a particular year, then you're getting down into small handfuls of people. So I would be very cautious about a group that is probably fewer than 25 people. Okay, so that covers sports squads, academic departments, that kind of thing. You need to think very carefully about libels with those, those sorts of sizes of group. Bracken, I'm going to jump straight into the questions in the chat. Um, so George Sims asked, how is it best to verify that sources you use are legitimate, especially online? Um, and George, what do you want to sort of just type in and tell us a bit more about what sources you mean? Do you mean kind of sources giving you information, like anonymous sources who would give you a tip online? 
Let's see if uh, George gets back. Hello. Sorry. Probably best to talk and explain myself. Um, it was just about some information you find online on different websites, whether it's been from polls, surveys, different newspapers, okay. news sources. Yeah. How, how do you go about making sure that? Well, or, or yeah, working out yeah, that I mean, they so that, haven't that, liable that's a kind of perennial issue for, for journalists and, and a lot of it depends on how um, assiduous they are in um, wanting to, to do that verification. I mean, some some news organisations will run articles on, on the most spurious of polling and, and sourcing and things like this. Others are much more, um, take a, lot, a great deal more care um about the you know the sourcing and the accuracy of it i mean i'd obviously advise the latter because you, you're going to run into fewer problems down the line if you've done your best even if you get things wrong if you can show you've done your best to verify the information you're getting that will help in things like public interest defenses and things like this um i think where you where you're getting information from perhaps um sources online that you can't always verify then the key thing is corroboration is using that as a starting point and saying right who else can we talk to to move this along to to verify this to moderate it to, to get some nuance in there to check this out um you know the temptation can sometimes be because of the you know fantastic story you're getting um to, to run it i mean there's a, there's a kind of there's a, a sort of cautionary tale from Germany. It was in the, in the breakup of the Soviet Union. In the breakup of the Soviet Union, there was this kind of a story doing around. It was like, like a kind of urban myth that got some traction um, about um, the availability of, a, of a, a substance called red mercury, which was supposedly one of the substances you needed if you were going to make a dirty bomb, okay, a, a, a kind of radioactive bomb. And there was a kind of this, this terror that was going around, breaking around the Soviet Union, all this kind of nuclear weapons everywhere and it was all going to get sold on the black market and we were all going to die in some fiery, awful Armageddon. And so the, this German newspaper was um, um, investigating this and so they decided that they were going to pose as terrorists trying to obtain red mercury, okay? And lo and behold, they found someone willing to give them some. I mean, what a massive story. They found red mercury, you know, blows it wide open this black market in radioactive material and and they go for this until they discover that the source of their red mercury is another newspaper investigating this posing as sellers of red mercury trying to find terrorists buying it you know so they they stung each other these two these two newspapers now this is what can happen. You can, you know, hopefully you're not going to end up in that sort of situation. But with anonymous, if you look for it, you can find any sort of rubbish online. And it is that verification and, and trying to track down other more authoritative sources. You can at least kind of moderate what you're publishing and give you some information which, which should lead you to be able to verify it or at least try to verify it. Um, and, and that, you know, might help in those circumstances. But it's not easy, you know, it's a, it's a real challenge. You know, the, the, the proliferation of kind of information which we can't always check out. Thank you, yeah, George, feel free to uh, ask any more questions or put your hands up if you wanna uh, do it again on camera. Um, I've had one sent to me on the chat uh, just by DM, so I won't read out the name just in case this person doesn't want it. Uh, they're asking what considerations need to be made with regards to privacy and or copyright when reporting on international stories, such as the George Floyd's trial. So I guess this is when you're, you're a student publication, you're very unlikely to have the resources to be able to provide your own yeah. content, that you are having sure. to kind of rely on other, other sources and the news organisations. Sure. So I guess about that. Um, yeah. Um, okay. There's no copyright in facts. OK, so if you as a news organisation want to rewrite um, all the news coverage that's going on, you can do so. OK, um, you can't um, use verbatim quotes doing that, though, because that would be a breach of copyright. 
you know, taking the quotes. So everything gets turned into reported speech. Uh, everything's rewritten. And, and, there's, and frustratingly for journalists, because when you get a massive exclusive, you want it all to yourself. But what you'll find very quickly is that your, your competitors rewrite it and publish it themselves, and they haven't done anything wrong in copyright in doing so. They might behave you know, slightly unethically, but in copyright, they've done nothing wrong in doing so. So you can always, um, you know, if there's a big event going on and you want to, um, you know, carry some live coverage of it to your audiences, things like this, you can you can do things like that, rewriting things. With regard to using, say, content that's out there on social media and stuff like that, if you embed it onto your website, then that isn't a breach of copyright. Because by embedding something, what you're doing is opening a portal on your website to the original site that it's hosted on, be it Twitter or Instagram or YouTube or wherever. So you can always embed content to your site um, and utilize it that way. The, where it gets to be a problem is, let's say if you're in an image and you just sweep across it and cut and paste it into your site, that's a breach of copyright if you do that. Um, sometimes you're looking at the likelihood of an action. If it's an ordinary member of the public who's posted a picture that you want to use, the likelihood of copyright action by them against you is probably very small. Not absolutely non-existent, but probably very small. The actions tend to be more frequent from professional organisations and particularly freelance photographers and um, video videographers and things like that. These are the people who are trying to protect their intellectual property. But you can utilise content from other sites, things like that, in, in that way. Thank you very much. Another one uh, in the direct messages to me. Uh... How solid is the outcome of a university investigation to report on individuals if it is talking about subjects like racism and sexism that would be defamatory? So I think okay. what that means, how safe are you to report like a, a university internal investigation if it, if it found that somebody did some wrongdoing, but it, still at the end of the day, it's defamatory and you're reporting on the results without maybe not knowing facts? Okay. Um. If it's something that's been produced for public consumption, you know, if it's a, an announcement of a disciplinary proceeding and things like this, then it has the protection of a defence called qualified privilege, which protects you against the libel action. So organisations that um, organisations that exercise a disciplinary function over their membership, so like sporting associations, things like this, you know, the students' union itself, when they announce their findings and their disciplinary proceedings we can report these things we can only report what's actually in their report but we can report these things without fear of a libel action where it gets a little bit more difficult depends on what what your questioner was saying is if this is some sort of internal report that has been leaked to them um then it becomes more difficult because it's not something that was intended for publication and so it wouldn't necessarily be covered by qualified privilege. But again, I, I would use that information as a sort of jumping off point. Depending on the nature of the situation and what, what's being revealed, it's clearly what, what we, we would argue in media, it's clearly a matter of public interest. If we are dealing with kind of allegations of racism or something like that, then it's a, it's a matter of public interest and something that the student body as a, as a wider um, d d deserve to, to know about and that um, what we would do then in, in mounting a public interest defence is you use that as your starting point. You then talk to as many people involved as you possibly can, including the person who is the subject of that disciplinary action to say, we've got this report about you. This is what it says about you. What have you got to say about it? And give them the the greatest opportunity possible to answer what's been said about them. And this right to reply is really important if you are you know, trying public interest journalism. You've got to give the, the targets of your journalism that opportunity to respond. And so, too many of the student media publications I work with sometimes will do this 
and they'll, they don't give people enough time. They'll say, right, we've got the story about you and we're going to press tomorrow at midday. And they're contacting them at like six o'clock in the evening. It's nowhere near enough time. You know, it's not reasonable. You, you've got, to, depending on the complexity of the story, you've got to give them a proper opportunity to, to, to take the information you've given them, read through it properly, make inquiries and come up with a response. And when, if they do respond, you need to weave that into your coverage. And it needs to be a balanced account. So you're not doing 20 paragraphs of accusation followed by two paragraphs of denial. That's not balance. You've got to mix the two together so that the allegations being made against this person are immediately followed by their response so that the reader gets this balanced account of what's being said. And it can be an effective way of mounting a public interest offence. So that's with that situation, depending on whether it's public or private report, that's where you know the, the, the law might, might or might not apply. Fantastic. Can see a question about satire there from George. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can see that, can't you? So, um, yeah. somebody's asking basically about the rules around jokes, sarcasm, and satire when it comes to yeah. and how you can sort of, I guess, defend yourself. Or yeah, your satire is well is well defended. You know, satire is um, defensible, um, but you know, it has its it has its limits. And you know, in private eyes, a satirical magazine, but they are forever. They are forever being sued by people because sometimes what they what they do isn't satire; it's a direct accusation. Private Eye does a mixture of um, straight news stories about various kind of nefarious sort of businesses and individuals and politicians and people like this. Um, but it also does, you know, clear satirical coverage. Um, if something is clearly satirical and never not meant to be intended to be taken seriously, then. Um, it is defended in, it's defensible in law. I mean, the Guardian did this. They did, um, they ran a series of articles uh, a while back now. It was written by Marina Hyde, actually, um, called a, a, peek in, a Look in the Diary of. And every week they'd, put it, they'd pick a particular um, celebrity and they'd do their diary for that week. Anyway, this particular week it was Elton John. And this, this Elton John supposed diary said things like, oh, my God, another fancy dress ball to go to. Um, they never raise any money for charity, but I just like dressing up. OK, now, Elton John, for, for those of you, if any of you are planning a story about Elton John, know this. He is very, very litigious. Right? He, he will sue at the drop of hat and he sued The Guardian and it actually got to court. And the court looked at it and they said, well, no, this is this is so clearly ridiculous, this, this diary that Marina Hyde had done. No one would take it seriously. No one would think that's really actually the diary of Elton John and what he really thinks. So it was, it was clearly satirical and couldn't be sued for. But then there was another diary that um, um, the Evening Standard ran a diary of a, of a politician, a very colourful politician a while back called Alan Clark, not um, Ken Clark, I hasten to add, Alan Clark, who was a oh, darling of the Thatcher government, quite outrageous um, and forever putting his foot in it. Anyway, he'd, he wrote some really, really entertaining diaries. He's a very good diarist, very funny. Um, and um, the Evening Standard ran a spoof diary, but it wasn't spoof enough. And people, would, people were taking it seriously. So Alan Clark sued them for libel and he won the court said it wasn't a clear enough sat satire and people would have read that thinking no this is actually what alan clark thinks so you know it, it, if you're going to do satire don't be too subtle okay you know make sure that people understand it's it's satirical that you're not somehow reporting as as news well, we've only got five minutes left so now right. is the time to go pile in <laughs> Um, just related, somebody submitted in advance, wondering about the rules more broadly about opinion pieces. Uh, can you just touch yeah. a little bit? Again, uh, you... opinion opinion is it, it's defence. Usually, libel is the issue with opinion pieces, and if it's if it's a, an opinion, there's a, there's a defence in libel called honest opinion. So we are allowed to express our opinions about the the, the goings on of things around us. Within the publication, within the broadcast, it needs to be clearly identified as opinion. So the viewer, listener, reader needs to know they're reading an opinion column. 
they're not reading news. So usually we delineate it within a program, within a within our kind of website or print material. You know, it's, it, there's a comment section and things like this, and so people people understand that what they're reading. Secondly, your allowed honest opinion must be based on facts. Okay, so you've got to get your facts right. And this is where this is where opinion opinion writers sometimes fall down. They have too loose a grip of the facts that they're writing about, or they're very selective in the facts they choose in which to express an opinion about. So you've got to get your facts right. You can have your own opinion, you can't have your own facts. So if you are going into opinion writing, if you're running, and I know that student media do run a lot of opinion uh, pieces and things like this make sure that they've got a grip of, of the subject they're writing about so that they're not basing their opinion on an untrue or inaccurate version of the facts. Fantastic. Um, another thing somebody else asked in advance, how do they make sure they have proper legal representation when faced with, in their specific instance, a libel accusation? Uh, What's what sort of the first thing that you should do? Well, and then I'll ask add on off the back of that. What's the first thing you should do if you get a, a libel accusation? Right. Okay. The way it usually happens now, because there's a there's a pre-action protocol for libel. They can't just drag you into court straight away. They have to give you a chance to sort the matter out. So usually you'll get what's called a letter before action, uh, and that will that will usually arrive from the claimant solicitors, um, explaining what the thing is about, whatever they're complaining about, and giving you a chance to sort of explain yourself. Now, at that point, you might be able to say, well, hang on, we've got photographs of him doing it. You know, and so you send back, well, here's photographs of your clients actually doing what we accused him of in our student publication. At which point then it usually goes away, you know, because you've shown the claimant solicitor that you've got clear proof of truth. Unfortunately, quite often we haven't got that though. You know, we, 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 we might have uh, got something wrong. So you can, you can have a discussion then about what evidence you do have or anything like that. You can, you can um, respond. Um, but if, if it's clear that you've got something wrong, if, you've, if it's clear that um, you've, you've libeled someone, first of all, if it's online, get it taken down, okay? Um, it stops the material doing harm. Okay, because so one of the, claim, the things the claimant has to show is, is serious harm. What you, what I would then advise doing is see how many, you know, if you've got the capacity to do so, look at the metrics for that web page, because usually it will be about publication. It might be print publication. If it's print, then, you know, you, you're in a bit more trouble. But if it's on, online only, and if it's been seen by a minimal number of people, then you can respond to say so. If say this has only been seen by however many, you know, couple of dozen people or something like that in which case you could argue very strongly that it hadn't done the claimant any harm because not enough people have seen it to do that however obviously you're not in the business of your web pages seeing minimal numbers of people you might look at the metrics and find it's been seen by several hundred several thousand people in which case then yes you know serious harm has been done if that's clearly the case, if you've clearly libeled someone, you've got it wrong, it's been seen by a large number of people, then at that point, you probably do need to get some legal representation to, to address it. Now, the union, if you are union sponsored, the union is in the frame for this because they are the publisher. Um, and so they need to be brought into the frame fairly early on. If you, if you get a letter before action, and you are a union-sponsored publication or broadcaster, you need to tell the union straight away because they may well want to take over the entire process of dealing with the legal and they may want their own lawyers to, to look at this. So that might be, you know, the initial, you know, response really is to tell the union and they, they take the matter on. In the meantime, amass the evidence that you have that might get you out of it or at least minimize the damage that's been done but really important though is don't sweep these things under the carpet you know don't ignore a complaint about something defamatory because it's a friday evening and you're about to go out to the pub and things like this when we're allowed to go back to pubs um 
you know, you do need to kind of um, take it seriously. And if something needs taking down, you need to take it down at the earliest po possible opportunity. Well, that's fantastic. And it takes us right up till the very edge of the session. Um, so thank you again so much, David. You have You're hopefully welcome. saved some people on this call uh, lots of money, lots of stress, uh, some hair as well, maybe <laughs> they might be tearing out. Um, yeah, we, like I said, we know people who are going through some of these sort of issues yeah. at the moment. So it's really relevant. It's really important. And testament, you know, hopefully next year we'll be able to invite you to. Uh, yeah, that'd be time. nice. That'd be nice. Yeah. Anyway, all the rest. <laughs> we really appreciate you joining us virtually. Um, and there are a couple more sessions coming up straight after this. I'll just direct people to. Um, in room one, our virtual room one, there's like a pitching workshop with um, four fantastic journalists. And then in room two, there's a conversation with uh, Terry Schultz, who's this incredible international journalist who covered some of the biggest stories from across the globe in the last few decades. So um, I've just popped those two links in the chat so you can uh, join the Zoom straight away. David, once again, thank you so much. Uh, Welcome. Thanks very much for inviting me. We had some great questions there. So have a good rest of your day and, uh, and hope, let's hope we can all go back to the pub fairly soon. <laughs> Thanks.